Hello, everyone, and welcome to the SRNA Ask the Expert podcast series. Today's podcast is entitled Neuroimmune System 101, a primer on how the nervous and immune systems work together. My name is Gigi DeFibri, and I will be moderating this podcast. SRNA is a nonprofit focused on support, education, and research of rare neuroimmune disorders. You can learn more about us on our website at wearesrna.org. This podcast is being recorded and will be made available on the SRNA website and for download via iTunes. During the call, if you have any additional questions, you can send a message through the chat option available with GoToWebinar. Our 2020 Ask the Expert podcast series are sponsored in part by Alexion, Genentech, and Viela Bio. Alexion is a global biopharmaceutical company focused on serving patients with severe and rare disorders through the innovation development, and commercialization of life-transforming therapeutic products. Their goal is to deliver medical breakthroughs where none currently exist, and they are committed to ensuring that patient perspective and community engagement is always at the forefront of their work. Founded more than 40 years ago, Genentech is a leading biotechnology company that discovers, develops, manufactures, and commercializes medicines to treat patients with serious and life-threatening medical conditions. The company, a member of the Roche Group, has headquarters in South San Francisco, California. For additional information about the company, please visit gene.com. And Viela Bio um, is dedicated to the development and commercialization of novel life-changing medicines for patients with a wide range of autoimmune and severe inflammatory diseases. The company's approach, which targets the underlying molecular pathogenesis of a disease, is aimed at enabling the development of more precise therapies, identifying patients more likely to respond to treatment, and pursuing multiple indications for each product candidate. For additional information about Biela Bio, please visit bielabio.com. For today's podcast, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Kyle Blackburn and Dr. Cynthia Wen. Dr. Blackburn received his medical degree from the University of Kentucky College of Medicine in Lexington, Kentucky, and completed his neurology residency at the University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas, Texas, where he worked with his fellowship mentor, Dr. Greenberg. During his fellowship, he plans to launch a study that will collect patient-reported outcome measures on adult and pediatric patients with transverse myelitis. The study aims to assess current outcomes in transverse myelitis and to inform the development of outcome measures for future clinical trials. Dr. Cynthia Wang received her medical degree from University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas, and completed a pediatrics and pediatric neurology residency at Mott Children's Hospital, University of Michigan Health System in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Dr. Wang was a James T. Lubin Fellow under the mentorship of Dr. Benjamin Greenberg at the University of Texas Southwestern and Children's Health. She's now an assistant professor in the departments of pediatrics and neurology and neurotherapeutics at UT South Southwestern. Her primary area of interest is immune-mediated brain disorders, including ADEM and autoimmune encephalitis. She's conducting a prospective longitudinal study on acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, or ADEM, to identify the clinical characteristics, treatment methods, and follow-up interventions that are associated with better and worse patient-centered outcomes. Welcome, and thank you both so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Um, so to start, I think it would be good just to give kind of an overview about, um, you know, the, the nervous system and the immune system and how they relate in, you know, in a normal time and then also how they are, um, how they communicate and relate in these conditions. Um, Dr. Wang, do you mind starting? Yeah, I'm not sure that I can hear Dr. Wang. Uh, Dr. Blackburn, are you able to jump in? Sure, I can jump in. Um, so first I'll kind of start with an, kind of an overview of the nervous system. I think it's something most of us are going to be pretty apparent with its role in the body and everything. Uh, so the nervous system is composed of brain, spinal cord, and, and nerves, just to kind of break it down. Um, it has important roles in controlling motor functions and controlling movement of muscles throughout the body. Uh, it has an important role in sensation an important role in thinking and memory, and uh, also plays a role in regulating the kind of the automatic functions of the body, like heart rate and breathing. Uh, so that's kind of a general overview of the nervous system. Uh, the immune system is uh, kind of a more widespread organ, if you want to call it that. Um, the big 
kind of cell type we talk about within the immune system is called the white blood cell. And today we'll probably be focusing on a type of cell called the lymphocyte, which is a specific type of white blood cell um, that's very important uh, in the development of many of the autoimmune diseases we're going to talk about today. Um, the immune system's pr primary role to keep it kind of simple is uh, patrolling and looking for foreign invaders. Uh, so that includes looking for viruses and looking for bacteria. Uh, and there's many ways that it does this to clear, um, to kind of clear those from the body and try to keep us safe, um, try to keep us from getting infected. Another important role it plays is in kind of patrolling for suspicious looking cell activity. Uh, so if there's a cell that looks like there's a potential um, that it may be dividing too fast or that it's functioning in another abnormal way, it will actually try to clear that cell from the body. And that plays an important role in cancer, um, trying to clear uh, cancer cells that may become cancer out of the body. Uh, and we're actually harnessing the ability of the immune system to do this for cancer treatment in many patients today. Um, now, there are, are many ways in which these interface, and it's it's actually been an interesting area of research in the last years, how, how the nervous system may direct the immune system to do certain things and how the immune system may communicate with the nervous system to launch a response. And we may not get too much into the weeds about that at the moment. Um, an important part of this interface is an area called the blood-brain barrier, uh, which is a barrier that exists around the blood vessels uh, in the brain and the spinal cord to try and protect um, foreign tissue that shouldn't be getting to the brain from getting in there. So there's this very tight um, structure that keeps things fairly regulated from coming from the blood into the brain or into the spinal cord. Um, that's one of the major ways that immune cells will kind of get in and out of the nervous system. So it's an important role there, and it's an important part of keeping the brain healthy. Uh, re more recently discovered, there's actually what we call a, a lymphatic organ, and, and lymphatics kind of control the movement of other things throughout the body, uh, movement of what various waste products. Those were recently discovered in the brain. It was classically thought that there weren't any interactions there. So now that's known that immune cells kind of travel through those as well and, and that may play a role in autoimmune diseases but that's still also very early finding great thank you um dr wang are you there yeah no I, i'm i'm calling in on the phone can okay. you hear me okay yes yes oh good yeah i think this will work better um yeah i i heard most of what dr blackburn say uh, said and i agree in full i think that was a wonderful summary um i would Maybe just add, you know, um, I, I, there are definitely um, ways that the immune system and nervous system communicate, and um, you know, part of that, uh, in that interface is the the lymphatic system. There are other things like um, there's actually a, a certain nerve called the vagus nerve that um, is uh, one another way that um, they communicate. This can um, kind of survey what's in the GI system and chemicals there can be transmitted as information to the nervous system and um, likewise um, there's a bi-directional communication there and then um, within the nervous system um, control of uh, the uh, different hormones and the endocrine um, organs that's another way uh, I think you know there can be some inner interface and again this is such a new field that so much of this is still being um, understood but uh, a lot of studies that we're doing at UT Southwestern and elsewhere are looking at the microbiome the composition of the gut uh, microflora to see how that might have um, you know interesting and unique roles to play in the immune system uh, and the nervous system great thank you so much um, and then how how do these systems kind of interact in the case of a rare neuroimmune disorder, either kind of during an acute attack or, you know, ongoing if someone has um, something like neuromyelitis optica or MOG antibody associated disease. Uh, Dr. Blackburn? Sure. So for um, certain diseases, um, most of the autoimmunity is felt to develop first within the kind of the periphery. So we're saying not within the central nervous system. So there are these cells that have the ability to um, have the ability to cause an autoimmune disease within the brain or the spinal cord, but they don't have access, and that's part of that blood-brain barrier. Um, the interaction in many of those cases comes 
likely at a time when that blood-brain barrier breaks down is one of the leading theories. So those cells that really don't have access to the immune system but could cause or have access to the nervous system but could cause autoimmunity if they got there now have access. So they, whenever the blood-brain barrier is compromised, which can happen for a variety of reasons, um, some people even think some infections could do that, but uh, whenever the that barrier is compromised, these immune cells could slip into the brain or the spinal cord and then encounter um, what we call the antigen, the, the protein that they are specifically reacting to, and at that time launch the the full-on autoimmune disease, which can cause the inflammation within the brain or the spinal cord. Um, at that point, the inflammatory system gets much more active whenever it starts recruiting other cells to that same area as well. And that can lead to the symptoms of the neuroimmune disorder of the brain or spinal cord um, that we, we see in these disorders. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Wang, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, yeah, I think uh, the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier probably has um, a, a big role to play in initiation um, of the um, autoimmune uh, neurological disease. And um, in terms of going forward in the future, uh, we, we categorize these conditions as ones known to be relapsing, and that includes things like neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, um, things like mo uh, multiple sclerosis, um, the information about MOG-related diseases is still um, developing, but that seems to be one that it can come back in certain cases. So um, I think in terms of, um, you know, additional um, exacerbations of symptoms with those conditions, and we have good uh, clinical and laboratory diagnostic criteria for how to figure out if you have one of those conditions, you know, those um, uh, exacerbations or flares can come back versus um, what we consider uh, idiopathic transverse myelitis and other idiopathic conditions um, where the immune system goes in and does injury. Um, it seems like in those, it's more of a one-time confusion of the immune system and then somehow it writes itself and um, you know, those people hopefully are, are not at risk for continued um, uh, symptoms where the immune system attacks the nervous system. Got it. Thank you so much. I think that was a, a really good overview. Um, and so, you know, relevant to kind of what's happening now um, with the coronavirus, the COVID-19, um, would you be able to just speak a little bit about um, kind of how this might impact someone with a rare neuroimmune disorder or, um, you know, just, just what's you know, uh, what people should be thinking about kind of in terms of, of this new um, infection. Dr. Blackburn? Sure. So um, this new um, coronavirus that has been circulating, uh, I think everybody's heard about it at this point. Uh, it does have some implications for many of the people listening today. Uh, any, we, for people that have a rare neuroimmune disorder, um, there is a, an issue with the immune system. Um, some people would say it's overactive, but it, it may be much more complex than that. The truth is we don't know. Uh, many patients that have autoimmune dis diseases of all types have something different about their immune systems. Um, furthermore, many of the patients that are at risk for having recurrence uh, diseases such as neuromyelitis optica uh, are going to be on medications that alter the immune system's function and they suppress certain cells that are important in uh, fighting off bacteria or viruses. Um, so the, the implications are that um, certain, pa certain people with autoimmune diseases may have a higher risk of developing um, not just an infection, but a, a serious infection uh, related to the COVID infection going around. Um, I've been counseling people around this and telling them that, telling kind of counseling them about this information and telling them it's very important that you adhere to the what you're hearing in the news, and that or what you're hearing from the CDC and what you're hearing from uh, Dr. Fauci on on the TV uh, about social distancing and hand washing. That that applies doubly to people with uh, rare neuroimmune disorders, and it also applies to the loved ones that they're going to be interacting with closely during this time. So, hand washing, social distancing uh, are going to be very important to controlling this outbreak in general but definitely apply to this population as well. Great, thank you. And Dr. Wang, do you have anything to add? 
Uh, no, I think that really um, put it nicely. Yeah, there's um, different risk factors. I think part of it is um, if the, the person remains on immunosuppression, that confers its own risk. Um, also, people who may have had, um, you know, a, a severe uh, case, if, even if it's a one-time um, uh, neuroimmune disease, such as an idiopathic transverse myelitis, if they had uh, complications of that condition, that would lead to things like, you know, problems with, um, you know, having trouble fighting off colds because of a weakened cough or just neuromuscular weakness in general, then I think they have additional risk factors. Um, and in some of the CDC guidelines, they talk about, you know, comorbidities that can be comorbid comorbidities associated with a neuroimmune condition. It can be uh, unrelated comorbidities. So I think kind of taking all those together as well as age um, can help people stratify their risk of, um, um, you know, having a serious illness with this uh, coronavirus. Great. Thank you so much. And we will be providing, you know, we do have a, a web page currently on our website um, devoted to uh, COVID-19 and we will be putting out additional resources. But, you know, thank you for for talking about it. You know, I know it's on a lot of people's minds right now and is, you know, relevant to our community. So, so thank you. Um, so to kind of jump into questions about, you know, that we got from our community about uh, this topic. Um, one of them is, what are the long-term implications of rare neuroimmune disorders on the immune system in regards to getting other autoimmune diseases like Crohn's disease, thyroid disease, rheumatoid arthritis? Um, is there, you know, kind of a relationship between uh, having one of these disorders and maybe having other autoimmune diseases? Uh, Dr. Wang? Uh, yeah. So, um, in some conditions such as neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, it's fairly well known that they have an increased incidence of other autoimmune diseases, whether in other organs or um, systemic, you know, throughout the body. Um, and that may have to do with several things, including any genetic predisposition to autoimmunity. They've looked at, you know, certain cohorts of uh, patients either with NMO or multiple sclerosis and other conditions and have noted that, um, you know, the way our body encodes certain proteins on immune cells seems to be related to our risk of getting those conditions. And, you know, those risk factors may make that person at risk of making, um, you know, generating a uh, dysregulated or overactive re response to other tissues in the body. So um, things like uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, lupus, um, Sjogren's disease, these are some of the things that have been reported alongside um, uh, NMO. Um, with a condition such as MOG-related disease, we don't see that association as much. Um, so I, I think it really depends on the type of autoimmune disease. And then for people who um, are known not to have NMO, uh, MOG, um, multiple sclerosis, um, I think there's less data uh, about that group. But uh, in general, I don't think the, the risk of uh, having another autoimmune disease is as high. But I think, um, you know, certainly something to, to, to be um, aware of with any new symptoms. Um, I'll stop there, I guess. Okay, great. Thank you. Dr. Blackburn, do you have anything to add? Well, I think that was a really great summary of kind of the landscape of risk of developing other autoimmune diseases. Uh, just to kind of tag on to that, a question we sometimes get as well, because we frequently talk about genetic predispositions uh, related to autoimmune diseases, are, well, what is the risk that my children or other people in my family will develop a disorder like this? And that's really one of the it's it's somewhat of an unknown. Certainly, we um, see in certain families a, a risk of developing different autoimmune diseases amongst the family. As an example, one person may have a, a thyroid-related autoimmune disorder, and a cousin may have multiple sclerosis, and someone else may have uh, lupus. Um, so there is maybe some genetic underpinning um, leading to all of that, but it is not a guarantee um, that children or other family members are going to have an autoimmune disease. It's not that clear cut. Um, there are other exposures believed to be related to that, and that, that's kind of the, what we're trying to sort out now is what is the, what are the additional factors in addition to genetic predisposition that may tip someone over? Yeah, that's great, um, Kyle. And yeah, I guess, um, you know, what you're, uh, what's implied there, there are things that we encounter such as infections at various times 
um, in a person's life that may have uh, an important role to play in uh, development of autoimmunity, as well as other uh, risk factors in terms of lifestyle, uh, diet, exercise. Uh, we definitely know vitamin D um, levels have a role um, to play in the development of multiple sclerosis, but suspect is another condition. So, um, you know, once you have the genetic risk factors, I think it's uh, doubly important to, to see if there are ways you can decrease your chance of um, perpetuating autoimmune, di autoimmune disease by um, looking at some of those issues, um, such as trying to maximize vitamin D level and, um, you know, generally trying to, to not contract illnesses. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, are you know, if someone with a rare neuroimmune disorder, are there any particular risk factors regarding you know, immunity to viruses or bacterial infections or parasites in people with uh, these disorders. Um, you know, I have seen some questions from folks in our community saying, you know, I've been diagnosed with transverse myelitis. Um, does that, you know, does that mean my immune system is, uh, you know, less able to handle, uh, you know, dealing with these sorts of, uh, you know, viruses, bacteria, et cetera? Um, Dr. Blackburn, do you mind just talking a little bit about that and maybe how it might differ depending on the, the diagnosis as well? Sure. And and I think for the rare neuroimmune disorders we're talking about today, I don't know that there's great data unless Dr. Wang is aware of something, but I'm not. Um, certainly there, as I talked about earlier, there may be a difference in the way a person with an autoimmune disease in general, uh, in the way their immune system functions. And there may be um, things like bladder dysfunction or respiratory compromise that will make them at increased risk for having an infection. That's going to depend upon person to person. But for our rare neuroimmune disorders, uh, I'm not as aware of any specific association with an increased risk of developing virus uh, or other infection in and of itself, um, at least from purely from a scientific standpoint. Theoretically, there may be an increased risk. Uh, certainly for people on immunosuppression, that risk will be there. Um, that's really kind of the landscape is we're not sure if there's a markedly increased risk, at least according to data that I'm aware of. Um, I, I would agree. Yeah, um, to my reading of the literature, I haven't encountered anything where um, people who have um, one of these rare neuroimmune conditions have, you know, a underlying immunodeficiency. There are immunodeficiency syndromes um, that can uh, relate to a dysregulated immune response and for them to get uh, other uh, autoimmune disorders. But I think most of that's um, what I've seen may relate to like thyroid autoimmunity, maybe um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, but not, nothing that I've seen with rare neuroimmune conditions. Great, thank you. Um, and then is there an increased chance of sepsis or um, you know, in these conditions from something like a urinary tract infection or a respiratory tract infection? Dr. Wang? Uh, yeah, again, it goes back to whether that patient um, is immunocompromised, are they on, you know, any immunosuppressive agents, and if so, what kind? Um, and typically in these uh, conditions, we treat um, with one of two agents, rituximab, which is a, um, a infusion that uh, kills off an um, uh, early subset of B cells. B cells go on to be the cells that make antibodies. So, you know, you can imagine if the body's not making a, uh, a, a normal, quote unquote, uh, response, then that person may have a high risk of the infection, you know, taking hold in a, in a broader way and leading to more, um, you know, not just the bladder, but also um, sepsis, which is, yeah, infection in the body's response to infection throughout the body. Um, and then, um, yeah, I, I, I think it also depends on their comorbidities. Again, if they have uh, underlying problems with um, breathing um, or with their bladder function, then, um, you know, that is a, another independent risk factor for having a more severe case of the, the infection. Got it. Thank you. Dr. Blackburn, do you have anything to add? I, I do think that summarizes it up pretty well. Um, from the bladder standpoint, certainly our, our patients that retain urine or have a need to catheterize will have a higher risk of developing urinary tract infections that may be treated several times uh, over the course of their life that then may become resistant to certain bacteria. So there is there is a risk there, uh, or sorry, that are, uh, that are resistant to antibiotics is what I meant to say. Uh, so there is a risk there that they could develop a serious infection. Um, for sure. Okay, thank you. 
Um, and then we did get a question about uh, from someone who uh, was diagnosed with neuromyelitis optica or NMO. Um, they were told that their immune response to allergens, so you know they've got environmental allergies, food allergies, uh, allergies to some medications, um, is not related to their the immune response that triggers their NMO exacerbations. Um, would you mind just kind of talking about and clarifying the difference, uh, Dr. Blackburn? Yes. So the response to allergies is, is utilizes the immune system. Uh, it utilizes different cell types. Um, so the, so cells like lymphocytes aren't as involved. There's a whole different cast of cells. There's a specific class of antibody that's involved in many uh, allergy responses. So in general, the, the immune responses are different between an autoimmune disease and an allergen. Uh, that being said, you certainly can trace if someone has several different allergens and then develops an autoimmune disease. It, it may speak to something uh, generally different about their immune system, as I've kind of been alluding to earlier, where the the issue with the immune system may be uh, may have caused dysfunction in both arenas. So it is theoretically possible. I think this is something where data uh, and research will kind of continue to look at what are those risks and what are those immune problems that could lead to this? Because there certainly is a theoretical risk that both could be caused by a dysfunctional immune system uh, in different ways. Uh, but I don't think that we can clearly pin them together just yet. Okay, thank you. Dr. Wang, do you have anything to add? No, I think that's a great summary. Um, I guess, you know, whenever there's inflammation in the body, um, uh, as Dr. Blackburn alluded to, there can be an increased risk for blood-brain barrier um, dysfunction or disruption. So, um, yeah, I think any sort of chronic um, inflammatory disease where there's low-lying inflammation, um, then I guess, you know, that, that may be a, a risk factor, but I think that's all just kind of speculative and uh, theoretical. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, you know, in terms of so when someone gets diagnosed with one of these conditions, they're often given um, acute treatments like IV steroids or plasma exchange or IVIG. Um, how do these uh, treatments kind of work with uh, the immune system or what, you know, to, to treat these, you know, initially and during these acute attacks? Dr. Wang? Um, in terms of um, independent of like an infection? I guess. Right, or you could talk about how it might, you know, deal with the infections. Yeah. How it might, you know, what kind of what the role of these medications is in dealing with the immune system and uh, mm -hmm. the nerve. Sure, yeah, I, I think the general approach of acute therapies is just to kind of shut down any inflammation um, because the, the main response, the pathologic or disease-causing response at that point would be the immune system um, either directly attacking um, parts of the, of the brain or the spinal cord through antibodies or the cells being just in general like too, too activated and causing um, just a, a change in the balance of um, inflama inflammatory versus um, more of the, the anti-inflammatory part of the immune system. So things like corticosteroids um, have a very general role in dampening down inflammation, um, you know, pr uh, uh, reducing replication of the immune cells, production of antibodies, and so forth. Um, IVIG is probably the unique acute therapy where there is not known to be an actual immunosuppressive role because um, it is essentially giving somebody pulled um, antibodies from uh, many, many donors. So um, it may uh, disrupt the body's ability to make as much antibodies or uh, interfere with the um, the activity of those pathological or disease-causing antibodies. Uh, I, I would say that would be sort of the more unique treatment. And then plasma exchange is um, sort of a dialysis of the immune system, removing the inflammatory chemicals and antibodies. So, um, you know, in that way, if you have less of the machi machinery that perpetuates an inflammatory response, then um, I guess you could ideally or you could um, uh, essentially see less of um, a response to other things like fighting off infections. But um, probably, um, in my experience, I haven't seen uh, that necessarily happen with plasma exchange. Um, yeah, so I think you know those during the acute periods can have a, a potentially immunosuppressive response. Great, thank you. And Dr. Blackburn, do you have anything to add about those acute treatments and then also uh, a the treatments that are used maybe for neuromyelitis optica or MOG 
related diseases in terms of you know how, what effect they have on the immune system? Sure, I think that was a great overview of kind of acute treatment. I, I would add that um, specific to steroids and neuroimmune disorders, th there is also thought to be an effect that steroids may help close a, a leaky blood-brain barrier. Uh, so that may also contribute to their immuno or their immunomodulating effects, and they're reducing the inflammatory response specific to these conditions. Is that now cells from the periphery, once the blood-brain barrier closes, will have a harder time getting into the brain or the spinal cord to cause problems. Um, you know, it is true that we do have newer agents to treat neuromyelitis optica, and we've been using other agents, uh, other immunosuppressive agents prior to that. Uh, to kind of go through some of the specific ones, our, our newest drug, Echolizumab, uh, or also called Solaris, uh, does just due to its mechanism and inhibiting specific proteins called complement, uh, does have an increased risk of developing a specific infection um, that can lead to a, a meningitis and inflammation within the brain, the lining of the brain. Um, so all patients that are going to go on that drug would need to be um, vaccinated or at least um, given an antibiotic prophylaxis uh, if they're going to start that drug um, due to that specific association. Um, related to other drugs that are commonly used for that condition, there is a rituximab is one of a very commonly used treatment across um, several different types of relapsing neuroimmune disorders. Uh, it has a specific impact on cells that make antibodies as, as we've alluded to. Uh, it does have a small increased risk of developing respiratory infections. Uh, they tend to be milder, uh, but it also some of these do also carry the risk of developing uh, infections like shingles, which is a, a, re a reactivation of the virus that can cause chicken pox. So if you're ever experiencing pain in an area or noticing a blistering rash in a specific area of your body that doesn't seem to be spreading, uh, you may want to reach out to your doctors about that because it could be uh, could be a shingles reaction, even in someone that doesn't have those classic risk factors like age. Um, just being immunosuppressed can cause that. Uh, some other agents will increase your general risk of getting a serious infection. Uh, so it is important that if you're experiencing persistent fever, um, dizziness, if you notice that your blood pressures are low at home, that you talk with your doctors. Uh, because in general, the risk for serious infections is likely going to be higher with most of these immunosuppressing treatments that we're using. Uh, and in particular, for chronic steroids, um, those steroids are one of the most effective treatments for inflammation. Uh, they also wreak the most havoc on the body and uh, suppress the immune system heavily if, they're, if you're on them for prolonged periods of time. Uh, so we certainly advocate for people coming off of those and switching to other agents as they're able because of the the many many side effects that can develop. Thank you for that. Um, and Dr. Wang, if you have anything to add, um, that'd be great. And also, what are the potential? Are there any kind of long-term effects of using immunosuppressant drugs on health in general? Uh, yeah. Um, so um, with some con uh, some. Um, therapies such as rituximab, um, there may be a very minimal risk of um, developing a neoplasm or a cancer, um, but I think most of the data has been very reassuring that, you know, it would require uh, a long, um, you know, many, many years um, of exposure as well as many of those patients had other uh, additional immunosuppressive agents. So sometimes we cannot, um, you know, say it was just one, one specific agent that contributed, but the kind of the cumulative risk. Um, and yeah, no, I, I would agree that you know um, certainly steroid medications that you take by mouth or you get through an infusion can decrease the response of the immune system. But you know our body has our own way of making those same uh, glucocorticoids, or um, and that really has to do with um, you know uh, how our body regulates response to stress and anxiety. And I think that's definitely an area that has been increased for many people for, for you know, um, many reasons going on in the world right now. So I think um, just to emphasize, you know, in, th in terms of things that you can do to modify your risk, um, getting enough sleep, trying to maintain a healthy diet as much as we can with the limitations, still getting some exercise. I think those are habits are good for increasing 
your your neurological reserve, so to speak, but also hopefully reducing your body's own um, response to stress, which is to secrete steroids and reduce the effectiveness of the immune system. Thank you. Um, and we did just get a question about um, what you know percentage of a TM diagnoses are related specifically to the herpes simplex virus versus being idiopathic. Um, but I would also broaden that to just how many we think are maybe related to some sort of infection versus um, idiopathic. Dr. Blackburn? Sure, it's a good question. Um, so for many of our idiopathic transverse myelitis patients, the, the long-running theory has been that, and you may hear this if you have other idiopathic autoimmune disorders, that an infection led to a confusion of the immune system. Uh, one of the most important, whenever we talk about that genetic predisposition, one of the most important factors on top of that is a exposure to an infection. And that, that's a very complex relationship. For certain autoimmune diseases, a specific uh, infection may lead to an autoimmune disease. Uh, but for many others, that relationship is much more complex. Uh, several different infections may result in the same autoimmune disease, or it may be that the overall burden of infections that you have in your lifetime or in childhood predisposes you to having a higher risk of an autoimmune disease. Um, so it's, as you can see, it's a very complex question. Um, for the herpes simplex virus in particular, I don't know that I have that data. Um, there are certain autoimmune diseases that have been associated with an increased risk of exposure to herpes simplex in uh, in the past, um, but I don't think that there's a specific relationship to TM. I, I would emphasize that there are two different ways that a virus could cause um, inflammation within the spinal cord. One is through direct invasion. Uh, there are certain infections that can happen in the spinal cord, an example being the enterovirus associated acute flaccid myelitis. Um, and then the other would be through a virus triggering um, in an autoimmune response or opening the blood-brain barrier and then having uh, having those cells exposed to the spinal cord causing an autoimmune disease, what we would call a kind of a post-infectious autoimmune disease. Um, we are presuming that for a significant number of these idiopathic TM cases, viruses may play a role, but that data is very early on that, and I don't think that we have anything clear-cut to, to kind of guide us there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Wang, any additional thoughts on that? Uh, I, I would agree, Dr. Blackburn. I, I don't know of any specific data with certain viruses, um, such as HSV and um, transverse myelitis, but I think just the general uh, burden of infection may increase the, the risk. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, you know, as we're getting towards the end of our time, um, what I'd just like to open it up in terms of, you know, what, it, what you think there is left to learn kind of about the immune and nervous systems in these disorders, uh, Dr. Blackburn. Sure. So I, I think the overarching theme of today is that the nervous system and the immune system communicate in a variety of ways, some of which may promote um, inflammatory states, some of which may inhibit them. That's still a very early interaction, and it's a very it's of strong interest to basic science researchers and immunologists and, and eventually to clinicians. Uh, I think the, as Dr. Wang has already alluded to, one of the biggest areas where we think there may also be a potential role is in the microbiome. Um, they're starting to discover that those, uh, the microbiome being the uh, bacteria that reside within your gut, um, it, there is some data to show that they actually produce neurotransmitters that may act on the brain uh, and that their effect on the immune system, um, how they influence immune system interaction, may also contribute to how the brain responds to, to different stimuli. So I think it's uh, an area that's ripe for research, and that's going to be one of the areas that we're exploring in the future. Um, things like, just does a certain makeup of the microbiome um, contribute to autoimmunity, or does the influence of the um, microbiome on the immune system have any risk of developing autoimmunity? Those are going to kind of be big questions as we go forward. Great. Thank you. Dr. Wayne, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those questions where I think so much is unknown that we may not even have the tools or know what questions to ask. But I think, again, looking at the the 
uh, individuals who develop these immune uh, neuroimmune conditions at young ages. We suspect in them they may have um, higher, um, you know, genetic genetic predisposition or higher burden of environmental factors that contribute to their risk. So I'm looking at, um, you know, those people, and I see primarily children, so I have an interest in uh, trying to figure out if they have specific risk factors for developing these conditions. Um, and then I think, you know, a lot of these questions are, um, you know, broad and affect, you know, us uh, like on a higher societal level, um, it seems like autoimmune diseases seem to be more common in countries that are more developed and in uh, countries where maybe the, the you know the healthcare system um, can't uh, enforce as much you know sanitation or uh, regular healthcare. Those people seem to be relatively protected from autoimmunity, and I don't think that's just because of detecting those diseases that maybe have something to do with you know. Um, uh, types of infections that we no longer, no, no, uh, sorry, no longer get in first world countries. So, yeah, I think those are um, very uh, broad questions that will be very um, inter and multidisciplinary and require people, of, you know, multiple backgrounds to to try to help tackle. Great, thank you. Um, and Dr. Blackburn, I just have a follow up question. Um, someone said that you mentioned that steroids can help to repair the blood brain barrier. Is this the, the is this also true for any of the disease modifying medications? I don't think that that's known as well if they can have an effect on the blood brain barrier, but it, it is it has been recognized for steroids that it can help it close, kind of in that acute setting. Got it. Thank you. Um, and just you know, as we're getting to the end of our time, I was just wondering if each of you could just give kind of a brief update on um, some of the research that you've done that you did or doing as part of uh, your fellowship. Um, Dr. Blackburn, do you mind starting? Sure. So one of the the biggest project that I have on my plate um, that I'm going to ask for the audience's help with today is a project uh, called the to give the long name and then I'll abbreviate it from here, the Comprehensive Outcomes Registry Exploring Transverse Myelitis, uh, also known as CORE-TM. This is a study that we've launched at UT Southwestern um, to kind of learn the long-term impacts of transverse myelitis. And this data is very important because it can give us an idea of how certain features of the disorder and perhaps even certain treatments may impact those outcomes in the long run. Whenever we're submitting um, clinical trial data to the FDA, they often ask for natural history studies. Um, so this could be a way of kind of gleaning information that they may find useful as we go forward with things like the Q-cell trial in the future. Um, so to kind of give you guys an overview of the study, uh, it's an international study. So if you have medical records in English that uh, our study team can understand, you qualify. Um, to qualify, you do have to have a diagnosis of transverse myelitis or acute flaccid myelitis. Uh, you also have to have an MRI scan from the time you were diagnosed. Um, so that would be the MRI where somebody came back to you and said, we are concerned that you have transverse myelitis. Um, we also uh, are trying to collect medical records from people who have um, transverse myelitis or acute flaccid myelitis during that initial phase. So for many people, they developed symptoms of transverse myelitis and went to a hospital uh, and may have received treatment during that hospitalization. So we would want those records around that hospitalization. Uh, we'll be collecting information like what treatments did they receive? Did they receive some of the things we talked about today, steroids or plasma exchange or IVIG? And when did they receive those? And what was there a perceived response to them during that time? And we'll kind of be digging deep to try and figure out if we see a response in those records. Uh, in addition to providing an MRI, as we to get to the MRI, we would be looking at uh, different features on the MRI to see if that may help us predict who's going to have uh, who's going to have improvement in their symptoms versus who may not. Um, in in addition to those. We're asking everyone that enrolls in this registry to fill out surveys that will relate to some of the symptoms they had and some of their perceptions of care at that early stages of treatment and kind of give us an idea of how they're doing today uh, in terms of walking function, in terms of bowel and bladder function, in terms of pain, stress and anxiety, um, so that we can kind of get a holistic picture of how transverse myelitis may have affected um, various parts of their livelihood. Um, and for people that have a recent diagnosis, we may query them in the future 
to and ask them similar questions. So that way we can see over the last few years, have you improved? Have how have things changed for you? So it kind of gives us a snapshot of how a person with transverse myelitis or acute flaccid myelitis may improve over time. Um, so we're tr to do efforts like this, it requires a lot of records. Um, we've been doing everything we can to get the word out of there, but and we're still very early in, in collection of records. And um, there, it is a little bit of a burden on people. I completely understand. It can be a little difficult to get a hold of your MRI scan and to get a hold of all of those records, especially if you went between several medical centers. But, but we do think that this is an effort worthwhile because it'll really inform, uh, give us information that will be powerful going forward. Um, so we're encouraging people that have that data on hand to consider enrolling. And, and to do that, all you have to do is send an email to uh, coretm, so that's C-O-R-E-T-M at utsouthwestern.edu and express interest and we can get get you the consent and kind of give you some information about the study from there. Um, we are trying to enroll people. Uh, if you enroll, we ask that you take the effort to get the records to us. Uh, we have had a few people that have had snafus in getting records to us or have had snafus in getting the MRIs to us. But I will emphasize that we've had people from other countries other than the U.S. get us their records as well. So with effort, uh, we can do this together and we can learn a lot of, we can learn a lot so i would encourage everyone to reach out to us and um, share with us if you can great thank you so much um and dr wang do you mind talking a little bit about your research as well uh sure um so yeah i'm um uh, coordinating a study on um, outcomes with um, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. The name of the uh, study is APERTURE, which stands for Assessment of Pediatric and Adult Encephalomyelitis-Related Outcomes. Um, understand, reveal, educate. Um, you know, Dr. Backburn talked a lot about his study. Uh, mine is um, similar. It parallels that, and you know, we want to know about people who have had the diagnosis of ADEM, what they um, came in looking like, what symptoms they had, what studies they were um, they had done, and what those showed, how they responded to acute therapies, and uh, I think one of the the biggest things about ADEM that um, uh, is maybe uh, you know mischaracterizes that it, it is a one-time condition that doesn't necessarily lead to, lead to significant um, uh, issues down the road. And I think the things that are emerging from this study is that you know in a subset of patients who have mod positive um, related ADEM, they are at risk of having additional um, neuroimmune diseases such as optic neuritis, transverse myelitis, or um, further episodes of ADEM. Um, and the other, uh, I guess, key area is that neurocognitive outcomes are very important because ADEM affects the brain. Uh, a person can look like they're walking and talking, and in a, a short clinical exam, that might not elicit the provider to think that there may be other um, more subtle signs of dysfunction, such as with um, you know, academic or psychosocial functioning. Um, so part of our study is also um, doing those surveys, um, as well as engaging our um, neuropsychological colleagues in doing comprehensive assessments um, of these children and adults, um, which, um, you know, we're either doing here or probably now more relevant than ever um, through a telemedicine um, kind of uh, route. So um, looking at that information, seeing if we can um, make a case that in, in certain patients this um, does uh, qualify as some sort of acquired brain injury so that those um, individuals can get long-term therapies to help with their um, rehabilitation. Great. Thank you both so much uh, for taking the time today and for, for working on this very important research that's you know, definitely going to make a difference for our community. So we, we really appreciate it and you know, appreciate you taking the time. Uh, during this, you know, very stressful time for, for everyone. So thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Yep. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Everyone stay safe and wash your hands out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good advice. All right. Thank you. All right. Take care.